What's going on, everybody? It's Monday. Time for Swift News. I have a, I have a jam-packed show for you today, as you can see here uh, by the rundown. So we are going to go a little bit of a rapid-fire mode. But a quick reminder before we do, you can always catch Swift News on the podcast. I usually release it the day after the video version. So if you don't have the time to sit down and watch the video version, you can always check it out on the go. All right, let's get into the show. First up, next Monday, Apple's doing this little conference called WWDC. You may have heard of it. Uh, so they released their rundown, their official rundown, because this year is a little different, right? You can't do it in person. You got to do it all online. As you can see here, it's in its 31st year. Long time for a dub dub. Uh, the schedule is pretty familiar, though. Nothing new here. We got the keynote next Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Uh, the platform State of the Union at 2 p.m. Pacific. If this is your first WWDC, let me break this down for you. So the uh, the keynote here is that's a lot of like marketing, if you will. Like you don't have to be a developer to enjoy the keynote and bask in all this Apple new product news. Uh, again, it's very non-developery. However, although it's probably my favorite part, however, the platform state of the union, that's where we get real, real developery, right? Like a, a non-developer would be bored out of their mind in the platform state of the union. So that's the difference between the two. Uh, then we got 100 plus engineering sessions. These are the typical videos they release. One key note here is uh, it's going to be 100, you know, over 100 videos. Videos will be posted each day at 10 a.m. Pacific. So normally they kind of roll out throughout the day because they're being live streamed. However, it appears we're just going to get a drop at 10 a.m. of whatever videos for that day. So it'll be like, you know, it'll be like your, your favorite TV show just dropping season three all in one day. So a lot of binging going on, I bet. Uh, and then here we have the all new developer forums where if you have an Apple developer program member, so you got to be, you know, pay that $99 a year. Uh, you will have access to these forums. Uh, and it says more than a thousand Apple engineers ready to answer your question. So I am, I'm very hopeful for this. Like this is, you know, the, the existing Apple forums were, eh. uh, so I am hopeful. I'd be lying if I wasn't a little skeptical, but hopefully Apple is putting some effort into this and this turns into a very valuable tool. And then of course you have the, uh, the labs, but you see here by appointment and, and many people say I've never actually gone to a lab myself, but many people say the labs are the most valuable part of WWDC You can get that one-on-one -on -one help with your project. So if you're interested in that, check that out. Speaking of WWDC, I think many of us would love to have Swift UI be the center of attention, right? The bell of the ball at WWDC. I think a lot of us are hoping for that. However, we have a great article here that says, why text view is my Swift UI canary? Kind of the canary in the coal mine, which means it's going to be like a, a leading indicator of where Swift UI can go. And I really enjoyed this article. I highly recommend reading it. Uh, it's kind of you know, is wondering, can Swift UI fully replace, you know, UI kit and app kit, right? Because, you know, I'll read it right here. One of the big questions on my mind is how well the fully declarative approach scales to complex apps. It says you can already build quite reasonable portal uh, apps of your favorite websites, which is, you know, 90% of the app market, right? Hitting a network call, showing it, all that stuff. Uh, but the, the complex app, he's wondering if Swift UI will eventually, of course, I don't think anybody's expecting it this year, but will it eventually be able to create very complex apps? Like he said, could you develop an app like Keynote or Xcode using Swift UI? So, and he goes on, you know, a lot more detail again, highly recommend reading the article, but they say that TextView is going to be like, you know, whatever they do with TextView is going to kind of tip their hand, if you will. That's, that's what he's saying here. You know, at this point, it's anyone's guess which direction Swift UI will take. And either way, I will be seeking out the documentation for text view, and that'll be my canary for where Swift UI is headed and whether it will soon evolve into a capable replacement for UI kit or app kit. So again, I thought this was an interesting uh, discussion about the fork in the road Swift UI could potentially be at. Sticking with Swift UI, we have a blog post from Majid here about view composition in Swift UI. If you haven't dabbled in Swift UI yet, the containers in Swift UI, as he says here, has a limitation of 10 uh, views like per container. Now you may think like, like he says, that restriction can sound ugly, but he thinks it's awesome. And it's just a way to force you into not creating these massive pyramids of views, right? It, it, you know, decompose those view into several reusable, you know, individual views uh, that can really clean up your code. So I don't know if this was Apple's intention, but it does kind of force you to not go crazy with these super long, you know, views and containers. And that's the crux of the articles, uh, you know, showing you how to actually do that, how you can use groups to do that, uh, view modifiers, et cetera. So if you're having trouble with your views and you're hitting that 10 view limit, this is definitely the article for you. And on the topic of Swift UI views, that brings me to today's sponsor, and that is fellow YouTuber Mark Moykins in Big Mountain Studio in his book, All About Swift UI Views. 
Now, I personally really enjoyed the style of Mark's books because you have the, the code on the right and then, you know, not only still images, but oftentimes animated GIFs showing you what the code is doing. Now, I describe this book as like a real page turner because, you know, there's not a lot of like paragraph reading, right? You're looking at the code, you're seeing what it's doing. And I always wanted to turn the page real quick to, to see what the next thing like I was learning was. So uh, I really like this style. So if you want to check this out for free, I have a link in the description to Mark Swift UI View's Quick Start book. And then if you really want to take that leap, he's got a whole Swift UI mastery bundle that you can check out as well. Now, before we move on to the next story, a quick note about sponsors on Swift News. I am only doing sponsors for fellow community members. If they have a project or a product that they want to help get exposure with, that's all you're going to see on Swift News. You're not going to see major like companies or anything like that, only to help out other community members in Swift. So just a quick note on that. Now let's move on to some indie developer stuff. Like I love hearing about this stuff. As like I've mentioned before, I'm starting to dip my toes in this world. But here we have Shahab, uh, Jay Penguin, puts out, feels like an app a week. He's always sharing on Twitter. If you're not following him, definitely follow him. You can kind of see his journey. But he says, a lot of app store users assume that indie devs make a lot of money. And while this may be true for many, it isn't in fact for most. Uh, for instance, he's made roughly 25 pounds uh, across this past month. I think indie developers need to be more transparent. So the reason I'm sharing this, you know, well said, but this thread is awesome because <laughs> a ton of uh, indie developers hopped in and started sharing, you know, their stories, how many downloads they got, how much they were making. So, you know, here's Noah Gilmore sharing. He makes about $20 a week. But then some other developers chime in with, you know, uh, some more, you know, maybe like longer uh, charts here. I'm trying to scroll down to find them. We'll get there. Yes. So Chris here launched in 2014, made less than a hundred dollars a month for the first two years. It takes time and is definitely not easy. So you can see this chart uh, begins in November of 2014, all the way to Feb 2020. And you can see the drastic difference. And you'll see a few other stories just like this. And I highly recommend reading this thread if you're at all interested in like indie development and making money on the app store. But the main takeaway that I got was, be patient, <laughs> like, and keep working on it. Keep updating your app. It takes time because there's a, a couple other charts in this thread that are very, very similar to this, where sales didn't really start taking off until a couple years into it. And on this note, uh, the big update here by Jordan Morgan, uh, he also replied to this tweet. He mentions it in this post, but he goes more in depth into his story and how this happened uh, for him. Right, he says, part of living the proud life of a puff, I like that, paid up front app is the reality of the bell curve. So basically, you, you're just living in spikes, like on your graph with a paid up front app, you know? Uh, and every time you do a major update, you know, you'll get another spike. It's very similar to another launch. So he, again, he goes into a lot of depth uh, into his spend stack story. So here's coming to a close in year one, and he shows he made about $9,000. But again, you can see his chart. It's just grows and grows and grows and grows. So uh, again, if you want, you know, Jordan goes very in depth into his, um, but it's very similar stories. Uh, so I highly recommend reading this article. Uh, also follow Jordan. He's sharing all the stuff he's doing with Spenstack. Uh, the moral of his story, he said, I can't find it. Um, oh no, here it is. Oh, so what, what did it? Was it solely the update? And here's, here's kind of also the gist of also be patient, but no, it was absolutely all because of the press. I finally have corrected the biggest mistake I pointed out regarding his launch. So a lot of people say it's very, very hard to make it on the app store, almost impossible. Um, but just doing it on the app store alone, like, like isn't enough. At least what I gathered from reading that thread and reading Jordan's article, like, you know, building a good product and marketing is kind of make or break for the app store. You know, I'm sure there's some outliers that just pop up on the charts and go nuts, but you know, for the vast majority of those indie developers, like knowing how to market might be the most valuable skill. Next, let's move on to the world of dependencies. And Xavier Lowmiller uh, has a nice little study he did here. Uh, what adding dependencies will do to your app in 2020. And uh, to kind of sum this up, because we are in a little bit of rapid fire mode, uh, he compared, you know, CocoaPods, Carthage, and Swift Package Manager. Those are like the kind of the top three uh, dependency managers going on right now. And he tested things like, I'm trying to get down to the actual like experiments. Well, he put in uh, 10 dependencies, you know, into kind of an app that are like a realistic mix of popular libraries, things like Alamo Fire, Promise Kit, Reachability, RX Swift, et cetera. And he tests things like, as you can see, like app launch times. Uh, and you can see how did CocoaPods do? How did Carthage do? How did SPM do? Uh, app size, you know, again, I highly recommend checking this out. I'm gonna scroll down to the summary here, but if you're really curious into the details of all this, definitely check this out. But he does kind of summarize it uh, down here. 
says things are looking pretty good for Swift Package Manager. It produces small binaries and builds as fast as Cocoa Pods. And here's the key. Here's the key takeaway that I took, right? And I kind of already knew this, but once all your dependencies are available on SPM, there's no reason not to switch to it, essentially. But basically, Apple came in and Sherlock dependency managers is kind of what I what I took from it, which is what I was kind of feeling already before. But if you want the hardcore numbers on like build times and all that stuff, check it out. And on that note of Swift Package Manager here, Dave Verwer of iOS Dev Weekly just launched his new product, uh, Swift Package Index. Now this is also built with Swift uh, on the backend, Swift on the server. So a nice little tidbit there. So again, you see right here, the place to find Swift packages. So if I wanna, I need to find a networking package. So I type in network, bam, Alamo Fire pops up there. Let's say, ah, I need something for charts. Okay, cool. Here's all the, the you know, Swift packages for charts. So let's click on uh, Swift. Nah, let's go charts. I'm familiar with this one. I've used this in Aluna. But this is also what's cool is the detail you get. Because oftentimes, right, with Cocoa Pods, you got to check, like, is it updated? Is it not? Well, Swift Package Index puts all that right here. So you can see, in development for five years, it has 1,700 commits, 42 releases. You know, all the open issues, pull requests, you know, the latest stable release is 3.5.0, released about two months ago. That's a key piece of information, right? When was the last stable release built? Uh, and so he has all this information for the various uh, Swift package managers. So again, a valuable, valuable tool to not only find, you know, the, the packages, but also learn about them to make sure they're up to date and, you know, going to solve what you need. Up next, we have a new book from Paul Hudson, Understanding Swift. Uh, and you can see here, it says, Answers, Common Beginner Questions, and More. And that's the whole point of this book, right? You know, as a lot of content creators do, Paul gets a ton of questions. And oftentimes from beginners, he sees a lot of the same questions over and over. So what he did with this book, like he says, this book is different from my others uh, because this one is trying to answer many of the why questions learners have. You know, why are tuples different than structs? Why do copies of a class share data, et cetera? So... This isn't necessarily more of like, here's how to build a table view. You know, this is kind of all the, the questions he, he gets. And he says it's the why questions, which in my opinion are, are some of the most valuable uh, answers you can have. So uh, definitely check out uh, Paul's new book. It is free. So no reason not to, right? Up next, we have some big news for Swift on the server, and that is from Tom Doran of the Swift core team. So this is Swift.org official blog, uh, introducing Swift AWS Lambda at runtime. Uh, it is my pleasure to announce a new open source project for the server, Swift server ecosystem. Swift AWS Lambda runtime is designed to help Swift developers build serverless functions for the Amazon Web Services Lambda platform. Now, here's the deal. I don't know anything about this. I've never dealt with this, so I can't give you my personal insight, but I know many of you out there are very interested and are working with Swift on the server. So definitely check this out. A big contributor to this was Fabian Fett. Uh, and the reason why I point that out is because if you are interested in getting started with this serverless stuff, uh, he gr created a great article here called getting started with Swift on AWS Lambda. So he you know, references the tweet in the article, and then he goes through a step-by-step -step, uh, tutorial on how to get started with this. So again, I can't really comment on this. I've never touched this stuff, but I know many of you are interested. So here's some great information for you. Moving on, we have an awesome article from Douglas Hill of PSPDF Kit. Level up your trackpad support using UI interaction. Now, with the release of the Magic Keyboard for the iPad, uh, it's no secret that's a pretty big game changer for the iPad. So if your product has an iPad app component to it or the one you're building is going to support the iPad, uh, trackpad support is an absolute must. Like it's table stakes for a great iPad app. So that's what Douglas teaches you here in this article. Again, I'm gonna scroll through it quick cause it's quite long with a bunch of examples. Very visual. This is what I love about it. Like we, we, you show the code and you show what the code is doing. We have pictures or movies. So I love those type of articles slash tutorials that yeah, the code's great, but actually show me what it does. It helps my understanding, at least, at least for me. Um, so again, a whole bunch, you know, uh, contextual menus, uh, all that stuff. Again, I'm scrolling quick to show you just a glimpse of the article. Article, but again, code, images, good stuff. So if you're interested in uh, implementing trackpad support for your iPad app, here you go. Next, we have just a reminder. <laughs> I wanted to share this again, just a reminder. It says your code does not matter anymore to, to others. Now, that's kind of a clickbaity title. But the, the point of this article, and you can feel free uh, to read it, is... At the end of the day, like, yes, you know, we want these elegant code solutions. We want our code to be awesome. We want to use the right tools. But at the end of the day, you have to remember your beautiful code and elegant solution is meaningless if it's the wrong product, right? At the end of the day, the software we're building solves a problem for a customer, right? So if you're building the wrong thing, it doesn't matter how elegant it is. So again, this is just a quick reminder. 
it's very easy for us, you know, software developers, engineers, whatever, to get caught up in, in the code, right? You, you can't see the forest through the trees. So, uh, you know, I'm not saying I agree with every word of this article. Just wanted it to serve as a reminder that make sure you're building the right thing. Make sure the feature you're building actually solves the customer's problem before you spend all the time, you know, making your code perfect and all that stuff. So again, just wanted to share this as a quick reminder. Next, we have a quick design tip from Steve Shoger. Uh, achieving an accessible contrast ratio is very difficult when using white text on a colored background. This, this hit me hard, this hit home, because that's like my default go-to, as you can see here. Like I always do like, you know, red button, white text, green button, white text. And you know, I see what he's saying. The contrast isn't quite there versus something like, you know, these labels down here where it's a, a lighter color with a darker text. You see, that's very, very good on the, you know, accessibility contrast issues. So just a quick little design tip there. Uh, I don't know if this is good for buttons because that almost looks like a disabled button, but certainly for some labels. So I don't know, I need to rethink my, my go-to you know, designs for this type of stuff, but quick little tip for you. Moving on, we have an article from Antoine Vanderlee uh, all about unit test best practices in Xcode in Swift. I've said this before, testing is one of my, my biggest weaknesses. It's a hole in my game. And you know, I attribute that because I spent basically most of my career creating like the initial product, you know, file new, the, the MVP. And in that phase, things are constantly changing, you're testing and iterating. So like push unit tests on, you know, under the back burner there. I know you could do test driven development. Anyway, it's a hole in my game, I admit it. But this is a great article uh, from Antoine Vanderlee, uh, basically the best practices on Xcode testing. You know, I'll just kind of scroll through it real quick to give you a preview. But basically, if you want to get started, if you haven't dipped your toes in the world of testing, Definitely, definitely, definitely uh, read this article from Antoine. Antoine always puts out uh, good stuff. Now we're on to AR Corner. As you can see, the Apple Pencil, you can select a color. Now, most of these are prototypes, anything I feature in AR Corner, but I just like to share them because we like to see where AR is going. I thought this was really cool, being able to select a color just by swiping up and down uh, on a pencil. Next up here in AR Corner, well, I'm gonna rewind this. Spoilers, spoilers. But anyway, look at all these wires plugged in. This is an awesome use case for, for AR, right? You scan this QR code over here and then it tells you via AR what is plugged into each port. <laughs> like that's an awesome use case. You see the mind blown emoji up here. Like that is, is so cool. Very, very helpful there. Uh, then we have Max Frazier here with Reality UI. Now I'm a little skeptical of this one, not because of Max work. I featured Max before, but uh, you know, these are like the typical controls that you see in iOS just brought into AR. The reason I'm skeptical is I don't know, I believe that Apple's gonna do a completely new new control thing with AR and their glasses. That's just my hunch. I, I could be completely wrong. If they do decide to bring in their you know, traditional controls, uh, this is probably what they'll look like. And I'll scroll down a bit uh, so you can see you know, how, how they're made. You know, there's the, the switch, there's the stepper, you can see the slider. Like I said, I think Apple's gonna bring in all, like a whole new paradigm, but if they don't, you're probably getting a preview here. Next up, I wanted to show this just because it's kind of freaky. Like I've said this before, I think sometimes walking around in those AR glasses might feel like you're on acid. Like you're just walking around and all this stuff's going on. That's kind of freaky, I yeah. thought, thought it was pretty funny. And then finally, the LOLs here, uh, the classic Simpsons meme here, right? This, this might hit home for some of you, right? Managers and clients are natural enemies, like designers and developers or testers and developers, or managers and developers, there's a common denominator here, uh, or developers and other developers. Damn developers, they ruined my code. Uh, I thought it was funny. Uh, you know, you see on Twitter, right, bicker back and forth all the time. Uh, so I thought that was pretty funny. And then finally, a, a quick little one-liner. After having published our first Android app, I decided to stop complaining about Apple. Again, same thing. You see a lot of complaints on Twitter. I've never developed an Android app, so I don't know. I don't know what the other side is like, but this did make me chuckle. But that wraps up this jam-packed episode of Swift News. Kind of out of breath. We got we got Dub Dub next week. Can't wait. Uh, we'll see you next time.